Today, I have my good friend, Dr. Ricky Brown, who is a plastic surgeon in Scottsdale, Arizona, but better known for his 7 million followers on TikTok, as well as several hundreds of thousands on YouTube and Instagram. But the cool thing about him and why he's here today is to tell us about all the things that can be done with breast reconstruction in the plastic surgery capacity for those women that are seeking either mastectomies to prevent cancer or having mastectomies after the diagnosis of cancer. Ricky, thank you so much for being here. What's up, my man? Good to see you, Sanjay. Thanks for having me, dude. I all those accolades right back at you. You're the, you're the man. Except for half of them. I'm not cool enough to be a surgeon. I don't have seven million followers, but here we are. So I'm. <laughs> hey, I'm followers sure. don't mean anything, man. That's true. You're you're helping people for a living, and so am I. That's true. And and I just and that's a great segue. I saw something that was very cool. I saw a video where you posted that now women can get basically um, prostheses or have like, you know, uh, restoration of their breasts after they've had mastectomies. And I'm probably using the terms wrong and you're gonna explain them to us in a second, but actually even still have their like muscle ability to be able to like make it move in the most natural way, right? Yes. So, so yeah, it's really amazing. So this is one of the things that's really changed in breast cancer reconstruction, I'd say over the past five years or so is typically when we do a reconstruction, there's multiple different ways to do it, but one of the most common ways today is to go direct to implant. So the surgeon will come in and do the mastectomy, um, be that nipple sparing or non-nipple sparing. Sometimes they're able to spare the nipples, sometimes they're not. But either way, we used to elevate the pectoralis muscle off the chest wall and put in what we call a tissue expander to stretch out the tissue over time because there's not usually enough room to accommodate the real silicone implant. And then we'd go back at another stage and put in the implant. So that's a two-stage reconstruction. Right. And then, then we started to move towards more of a one-stage reconstruction where we were able to do these more skin-sparing mastectomies. We had enough skin to actually put the real implant in instead of an expander under the muscle with maybe a little mesh in there to help hold everything in place. Um, and so that was the next evolution, and a lot of people still do that. The evolution that's new that's now something that we're doing is but now we realize you, sorry, that- To ask you on those two things, when you say skin-sparing, you mean like- people were going more superficially like into the actual skin prior to that with their mastectomies? No, so you know, the old radical mastectomies, they would take a huge, right. huge section of skin out of the breast. And so it was really tight when they would close them, which meant if we tried to put an implant in, there's no room for an implant to fill and expand the breast to give them shape. Well, come along, you know, fashion forward, now we have these more skin sparing mastectomies, which basically means they just take an ellipse around the nipple and the areola and take a very small piece of skin off with the specimen because we know that oncologically, we, we can save the skin safely depending on if some tumor margins are closed, you can't do that. But in general, we save so much more skin. So now when I come in, I've got 90% more skin than I might've had after a radical. And then I'm able to reconstruct them on the table and actually have them leave with their real implant. But so, and that's, that's huge. Yeah, that's humongous. But so, so I'm glad you brought up radical mastectomies. Like there was a point at the beginning where when they were looking at breast cancer, like decades and decades and decades ago, I mean, they lumped like everything off. I mean, just take out the pec, take out yeah. everything. They're like, why not? Like if you have a breast cancer, you know it spreads locally, just take it all out basically, right? And so yep. that's like a radical means like you even take out the, the ability to use your pec. Then they went into modified. Like everything is about how little can we do without losing the survival advantage. So that's what we look at. That's how we have recommendations. When we're talking about a, mad, uh, a modified mastectomy, so they're taking out all the breast tissue. What changed in the modified setting where you're not taking out the pec that did the skin sparing and allowed not the two-step process, but the one-step process? So what allowed the one-step process was the realization that it, the skin envelope wasn't the issue that we, you know, that there's a distinctive capsule which separates ah. the breast tissue from the actual fatty tissue that's underneath ah. the skin, so the spontaneous tissue. So now that we know that there's an actual breast capsule, it's getting the breast capsule out with the breast and the specimen is what clears the oncological margin. Now, sometimes that border between the tumor and the capsule and, and the in the in the subcutaneous you know plane is so close that they've got to take some skin or take more 
more fat from underneath the flap than they realized. But that's really, that really was the game changer, right? Like we learned that there's this breast capsule. We don't need to take all, we don't need to thin the skin down so that the blood supply is compromised. We can just get the specimen out and leave a nice skin envelope behind and do exactly what you said. We have decreased the amount that we need to take and we've, Im we've improved or kept survival the same. And so that allows us now to help patients go from these long drawn out six month or a year reconstructions to get them almost done most of the time, one and done, minus little revisions that we might have to do. And a lot of patients, not everyone doesn't fall into that category. Right. There are things and reasons why I might have to do a two stage, but that's been the innovation, right? And so what I was going to say is, what's when did that? that start happening? Um, what, where we could go to one stage? Right. Um, we've been doing one stage for years. I mean, I've been I've been out for 13 years, and I've been one staging for eight to ten at least, so um, where we just go direct to in, direct to implant. You know, eight years I would say, okay. um, and that that's beautiful, right? Like being able to tell a patient, you know, the the surgeon's going to come in and clear your tumor margin. And then I'm going to come right behind them and I'm going to put in an implant and this is hopefully going to be a one and done is just an amazing, amazing advancement for the patient. Now, not everyone can do that. There are reasons why I can't do a one stage, but most everyone that I can reconstruct today is a single stage operation. And we always tell them, listen, they're going to settle differently. They're going to, things are going to change over the course of the first three to six months. And you may need a revision down the road, but maybe something minor, you know, for shape and something like that and not have to go through two major operations like the expansion phase and then the implant phase. And the reason that's so important, at least from my setting as a medical oncologist, as a cancer doctor, is the two stage got tricky because, and we're going to get into this, this is what I really want to talk about, the psychology and the mental health and really the confidence, you want to preserve all of those things. If you're trying to beat someone's cancer and make sure they're cured forever, you want to make sure that you have reduced the most debility. And debility isn't just in like physical, like, you know, what can they do and not do, but even also in the mental and emotional. You want to, you want, you want to have their emotional health as close to as a pre-cancer diagnosis as possible. And so what part of that was like, and where it got tricky with the two-step process, I remember in fellowship training years back, is that the big question is about the radiation. Are you getting radiation oh, yeah. or not, right? So the people that don't know, you know, logically, when I said you do radicals, you take out everything. At first, you're like, that makes sense. Was this the best chance of not leaving anything behind? That's why you do studies at a super high volume to see can you get away with less. And what they did was, mm -hmm. and it's very well evidenced, that if you do a simple uh, uh, mastectomy or like a lumpectomy, lumpectomy where you yeah. take out, excuse me, a simple uh, lumpectomy where you're taking out uh, the cancer surrounding tissue, but you leave most of the breast. When you do that, the survival is not any worse than taking it all out if, if you get radiation afterwards. Yep. So basically, yep. you're out from getting the whole breast tissue and all the tissue removed is when you're doing radiation after a lumpectomy where you're taking out like a portion of the breast. So that's, let me make that clear for everybody. So if you think, why are they only taking a little bit? I have breast cancer, take the whole thing out. That's why the studies show the radiation does the trick. However, with radiation, you end up having skin tightening, you have scarring, the whole anatomy changes. It makes things very challenging for like, you know, putting a prosthesis in and, and, and having more stuff on the plastic side, number one. And then number two, what's called adjuvant treatment. So that means, is there an indication based on these high volume studies that you also need chemotherapy? So if you didn't get chemotherapy before, there's a good chance you may need it if you're a little more advanced. So you do all the chemotherapy yeah. over three to four week, uh, three to four cycles, which is like 12 weeks or, or less or more depending on the circumstance. Skin and stuff, everything shifts around. And then you do your radiation, which is another six weeks. So like, it became very challenging. So the fact that you can do a one-step process is pretty awesome. But of course, in this, in this circumstance, you're already talking about taking out all the breast tissue and replacing that. So somebody may say, yeah. well, Sanjay, why are you bringing up radiation? And you just said you don't need radiation you can take all the breast tissue out. But sometimes if you do have lymph nodes in your um, armpit or what we call axilla, that means that like sometimes yeah. you may need axillary radiation. So you're not worried about where the cancer was, but you know where right. it went. It went on that highway, that lymph system. And so you want to radiate that stuff, even if it's been dissected or not, if it's just been one lymph node or all of them, to make sure that you've reduced it. So all that to say, you know, I digress, but I know people are very interested in kind of like saying like, why, what, why not, and all that stuff. And that's where that process happens. But the thing is- Yeah, radiation's a mess, dude. Yeah. 
it's a mess. It, it really, really mucks up what we do, but it's life over limb always. Right. But there's all these weird scenarios where we don't think they're going to get radiation. We go put the implants in, then, oh my God, they're recommending radiation. Now you get a radiated breast. It gets tight and contracted. And then now, oh my God, the tissue's no good. We can't use it anymore. If they're having pain, we got to now talk about flap reconstruction. And it's a really, really tough dance that we have to enter into with patients. It can be very tough. And, and trying to like, pick the right sequence for the right patient is awesome, but then you get in the middle of it, and like you said, it's like, oh crap, we didn't think we needed radiation, now we need it, now we gotta like change the whole thing up. Right. It, it can get really messy. And I think one of the, I think two of the reasons if I had to guess would be one is like, it, it ended up having like, what's a sentinel node, meaning the first node yeah. where the stuff from the cancer drains into. You take one or two of those out, the ones that go first, if you don't see cancer, you feel good about it, but if you do, then suddenly like something may change. And the second circumstance might be when it's more anterior. So anterior means coming towards your nose. If you see that mm -hmm. it did involve the skin or had something like, you know, sketchy in the lymphatics and suddenly you're like, oh, this stuff matters that may have been left behind because it may mm -hmm. have cells kind of hanging around that you, we couldn't see. Why? Because obviously the naked eye can't see as well as a CT scan and a CT scan still takes 700,000, 600,000 cells of cancer just to even see it on a, you know, on a CT and MRI less, but still takes that's hundreds crazy. of thousands. So that's, that's the whole reason. That. Yeah. And that's the whole reason we do adjuvant because people say, and they always say this, and I can't pick at you. You wanted to do surgeon, but, but, but your, your plastics and your, you know, restoration now, but the surgeon will always <laughs> say, I got it all. And so the most common right. question is the surgeon said, I got all the cancer. Why do I need any treatment after? When they say I got it right. all, they mean macroscopic, what you can see with your eyes and presumably it all looks like it's normal. The reason right. we say you do or don't need treatment afterward is we look in those circumstances at hundreds of thousands of patients and say, we got them all in all of them. And then you see what the recurrence is. And then when you're like, oh man, we think we got them all, but we didn't, then you do a treatment and say, does it reduce the chance of recurrence? And best, does it improve survival? Those are the questions you wanna ask your oncologist because then adjuvant is indicated, meaning there is a survival benefit, even though a hundred people think that it got better, that it's all gone. We know they recur and we know the survival is better if you get adjuvant afterwards. So that's, sorry, another tangent. And that's but, precisely what radiation is for, right? So when you do a lumpectomy, right. the margins can be close. So we radiate to make sure nothing leaks outside of the bag. Whereas when we do this total mastectomy, the idea is we're well around everything that we didn't get at all, but the chances that we didn't for you needing radiation or, or just non-existent. So that's why lumpectomy and radiation is equal to mastectomy exactly. in most scenarios. Because you're either taking it all out or you're making sure you didn't leave anything behind. So that's, that sounds, yeah. that's a great way to put it, Dr. Reed. You should have done surgeon. And then the post, <laughs> you can always go back. It's certainly rich enough. Well, I'm just kidding. That's right. But uh, so, the sec so, the, so that's all part of like the treatment of cancer. But the big topic now, and really for years, is prophylactic mastectomies. And what that means is prophylaxis, if you've ever gone to the, you know, one of these countries when they're like, oh, they say I need prophylaxis or prophylactic malaria drugs. That means that you're taking something to make sure you don't get it. So a prophylactic mastectomy means I don't have cancer, but I have a high enough risk. Either I have a BRCA mutation, God forbid, like in my family or, or especially myself to where I know my risk is high enough to where that makes sense. Or what people are doing now is they're giving you risk, not just on, oh, this is your race and this is your age and this is whatever, here's your risk. They're actually looking and they're gonna to continue to look way more tailored. They're gonna look at you specifically, your BMI, your lifestyle, like, like mm -hmm. your own genetics that, don't, that aren't BRCA, but a whole bunch of other stuff. And they're gonna make very calculated recommendations that may scare you. My wife got scared herself and she's an oncologist when she saw her twin sister had this like crazy high risk and her twin sister's in shape and works out more than she does and all this stuff. I hope she doesn't get mad at me for saying that, but, 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 <laughs> but she got worried, you know, cause it is scary. So then if this conversation comes up for you, the, the question is, what is the trade-off? And that's what made me so excited about what you brought to the table in the TikTok because yeah. you want to preserve a quality of life. You want to like, you know, like self-image is important, emotions and like, you know, sexual, like just like image of one oneself is very like uh, kind of contingent or related to somebody's like confidence and happiness, all these things. And you found a way, I mean, I, I don't even discover the thing, but you're doing it to where like can people can even preserve that like movement. Yeah, it's crazy, man. I'll tell you. So we see, as you alluded to, like the markers today are so much greater. You know, it's not just BRCA1 and 2. There's all kinds of markers now that, that are indicating this really high risk for people. And so we've seen a huge influx of these prophylactic mastectomies and like people in their 20s and 30s. So I see women in their 20s and 30s. I just did one last year of a girl who I think was 24 
whose mom was positive. She was not even married yet. She was about to get married and decided to have a double mastectomy because she just didn't want to live her life with the risk of cancer, right? So we, in those cases, what's so beautiful about those reconstructions is they can have a nipple sparing mastectomy where they actually leave the nipple, right? Because we're not yeah. worried about cancer. Right. We just want skin to live and we want to get the whole breast out in a safe manner. And in those cases, those women literally look like they get breast augmentations because I can go in and put an implant in to basically replace what they had. And sometimes they look even better than they did, you know, before that's not a reason to do it. Right. But I'm just saying it's amazing that sometimes that that is, is better for them. And they just have a single incision in the breast crease and that is it. And they've got a reconstructed breast and I've seen her back a year out. She looks amazing. She's happy. And she gets to now go on and live the rest of her life. Albeit, you know, she doesn't have her native breast. And for a lot of women, that's really difficult. But, you know, a lot of the girls today, I see these young women are just so much more mature in that they get that their breasts don't define them and they'd rather live a long, healthy life. And it's like, it is what it is, you know? Um, and it's just so fun for me to be able to be the person who can give them back their physical existence and make them feel whole again and feel good in clothing. So the nipple sparing mastectomy stuff that we're doing today is amazing. And you're preserving it's amazing. the pectoralis muscles to where you, you know, you still have the- function. Well, and that's, we never answered that. So the, in front of the pec versus the behind the pec, what you're talking about is, so here was the struggle. We used to put the implant behind the muscle and they can get something called an animation effect where when the implant is under the muscle, we have to release the pec so it kind of window shades up in order to accommodate the implant and they sit well together. And then we'd cover the lower pole with the mesh. Well, when they would flex or do something, they would get this pinching down across the middle right. of the breast because the leading edge of the pec would sort of pinch down and it didn't oh. look good and it could cause implants to flip and it was weird in social settings that they were doing something that activated their chest or they're working out. So then fast forward now what we can do depending on their skin envelope if they've got a really nice skin envelope instead of putting the implant under the pec muscle we now leave the muscle down we put it above the muscle and we can sometimes we have to put a little graft in there to hold the implant in place and redrape the skin over it they look great they heal great they do great there's a lot of scenarios where that doesn't work but now what that's done is that's taken that function that weird function of the pec that they used to get with the animation effect and they don't have that and they can do pull-ups and push-ups and it doesn't affect the implant and so that's been another sort of leap forward in the reconstructive space that's really really helped change the game and what we can do and that's more natural right i mean obviously your breasts like your native breasts sit over oh like, yeah anyway. So it's basically a recreation of the same thing. So it's funny you say that because when I used to do, when I would do my sub pectoral or below the pectoral reconstructions, before I would start my reconstruction, I would always say, hey, give me a 550 cc sizer. Let me just pop that in underneath the skin. I just want to see what it looks like. And every time I would throw one in, I was like, man, I wish we could just leave this above the muscle. I mean, this just looks no so way. good because it's it fills the borders out perfectly with what the native breast used to be. And so then fast forward, when this became a thing, I'm like, see, we were doing it before they knew you could do it. It should have been your name. Real Damn TikTok. it. <laughs> That's amazing. Now I'm just the real TikTok doc dancing to pimple popping. That's right. You missed, you missed, you missed the big one, but I'm sure it's headed your way. So this, so, yeah. you know, one of the questions that a lot of people have and you know, I, a lot of people say, oh, I'm not going to make an opinion because some people have like opinions on people with opinions. But honestly, I believe the data really supports like breastfeeding and kind of what it does for like, you know, uh, yeah. newborn health. And, and it's kind of just crazy how even the time of the day has different stuff in the milk and this and that. So, of course, I also don't think anyone should feel guilt if they didn't like, you know, or couldn't or any of those things like, you know, I don't think my wife was actually I'm not sure. But but like it, it obviously if you can, great. If you can't, like, it, there should be no guilt about it. But there seems to be a lot right. of benefits, especially with immunity and stuff like that. So that is one a concern about prophylactic mastectomies. And depending on the kind of BRCA, and like I said, if you're you know, a female watching this or you have a loved one that's a female, if you're not in a city where they can do a, a personalized risk score, like, there are a lot of places that do that. And if there's any concern or family history, you know, it's definitely worth considering going to get a personalized risk profile instead of just a bunch yes. of broad stroke, brush stroke categories that you fit in. And then you can really have a good idea on, like, how frequent should my imaging be and, you know, all these things. But that's a direct, as far as having children and everything, that is actually a direct risk factor on whether or not you get breast cancer. And it... At first, you're like, well, why, why should that matter? But if you really think about it, 
It makes a lot of sense. Cancers happen because of turnover in time, right? Cancers are a disease of the elderly by far more. And you're like, well, no, no, I know kids. And thank goodness kids, you know, have 85% plus like uh, cure rate, but, but by far the volumes, the older you get up to like one in four, you know, if you're over 75 or 80 as a female of uh, getting, uh, getting breast cancer are just more the older you are. Why? Because these things are turning over, they're getting mutations that aren't detected by your immune system, and then that can run into trouble. Well, when you think of that, and you think about menstrual cycles, that's turnover, right? So like females will have like kind of like an increase in their kind of breast swelling during these cycles and, and you get these hormonal kind of up and downs. And that's why both for ovarian and uh, breast where there's cyclical, basically like turnover up and down, like shedding and this and that, the less of that you have, the less chance you have of having cancer. So that means if you had your period onset late, that's a good thing, meaning like in terms of, yep. of getting the breast cancer versus if you had it really early. If you had yep. your menopause early, that's a good thing because you stop the cycles and turnovers compared to having it late. And then if you've had uh, multiple kids, that's where um, I think it's not additive. Like each kid after two, three, four doesn't mean more, more, more. But having like two, because you had those nine month periods in each case where you're not having the turnover. And then most exactly. women or a lot of women when they're breastfeeding uh, they'll actually not be able to get their cycles, uh, you know, reinstated because there's a kind of a feedback that that's a more relaxing feedback. Have, right? Yep. Right? Though it happens all the time. You hear plenty of stories where somebody didn't think they were having cycles and got pregnant during that phase. But it's an right. interesting thing. Number one, that can reduce um, the chance of having these cancers. And in addition, of course, and I wish I hate I wish it wasn't the case where doctors would say oh, diet and exercise will help, like, reduce your chance of X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Like, I don't like that. I, I wish it was different, but there are some circumstances, and I tell my patients, in this case, it truly definitely reduces. So low-fat diets really seem to help to some capacity with, with cancers, as well as exercise, exercise, exercise. It just helps. And, I, and it even guilts me, and you're very fit about it, and I love your proactiveness, but, you know, these things matter. They do. I mean, in the case of breast cancer, I mean, you know, I'm double boarded, so I did general surgery first. So I was in the world of that side of breast cancer in the beginning. And that's why we always ask patients age of menses, menopause, all that, because it's all about estrogen exposure to these hormone sensitive tumors. And when they get these breaks of being pregnant, they have less exposure. And that's why also we talk about with obesity, they had, they carry a higher estrogen burden. And so we sometimes right. see them in the, in that population because there's more estrogen if they have a hormone sensitive tumor to stimulate it. So, you know, health and wellness is, is everything. And, um, I know that not everyone's meant to be a twig or to be little. I, I don't even care about that. It's never a, a fat versus skinny thing. It's more of, of a healthy thing. But in this case, we just know that certain foods, and in certain situations that lend you to more estrogen exposure or hormonal exposure to your tumor can, can be more detrimental. And so that's why we encourage the lifestyle change and, and the diets like you talk about. It's huge. It's huge. And, you know, it's, you wish it's, it's, and it's not talked about or respected enough what happens in a hormone positive breast cancer and having to wipe yeah. away that hormone afterwards. So if somebody gets diagnosed yeah. in their fifties or sixties, now we're wiping away just the last bit. So you might say, oh, if I'm postmenopausal, I can't have that much estrogen, right? That those those meds that you take after are even for that conversion in the fat cells and in your adrenals yes. and stuff. It it takes away even the peripheral estrogen, the little bit that made you not have the worst symptoms of your menopause. And I just don't think it's respected enough. I think there's a lot of reasons for that. Some of them like, you know, a sex-based kind of bias and all these things. But that's where prevention can really help the debility, and that's not studied enough. It's like, what is the debility? Even if you cured somebody with hormone positive cancer, now remember, some are yeah. triple negative, so it doesn't, it's not applicable. But even though you cured and everything, if there was anything to prevent it, you could spare them if somebody has a difficult time for those five years on anti-hormone therapy or 10 or in a metastatic setting where people can live years and years and do, they still have to have their hormone wiped away. So you, you hate that even those, even if it's four or five years of a metastatic hormone positive cancer, they had to like the things that are important, sexual health and self-image and like emotions and, and mood, they have to be compromised for that treatment. Well, Ricky, I appreciate your time so much. This was really awesome. Yeah, bud. I think we have a lot My of pleasure. stuff planned. I love your outspokenness on social media and just, you know, we're trying to empower people and educate people and give them access or even tell them about, you can't even access something that you don't know, right? So like we're trying to like let right. people know what's out there because you may not know better. And, and strangely enough, like social media seems to be one of the most reachable ways to tell people that wouldn't know better about what's available out there uh, and to make it happen. 
Yeah, dude, it's crazy. Like a lot of doctors just don't feel comfortable on camera and they don't want to get on camera or it's very time consuming. But I have to tell you what social media has done for my practice is unbelievable, mm -hmm. not just bringing in revenue, but building a rapport with the community across the world. And people, I have people, and I'm sure you do too, from like Australia and different parts of the country that will message me and have questions, which is what is so cool about our MetaDocs adventure. It's not for here, but that's what's so cool, right? Like we're bringing, we're breaking down borders and it's just an unbelievable way to be able to communicate with people around the world and, and offer them solutions, right? In countries where they don't have what we have. Yeah, yeah. So it's been really huge for me and dude and of course it's led me to you and all the other TikTok docs that we've met on TikTok and Instagram like I feel like the past two years with this whole um, pandemic like I've built this medical community on social media that I didn't have before the pandemic because we were just all day right like we were like me, me messaging you like dude I'm so insecure like how do I get followers like you have do you remember that like, where I'm dude, like I don't know what I'm doing like, like, like I'm like you're the man you got this I still remember that and you're at <laughs> seven milli bro now like I it's remember crazy like, God, hang is gonna hit the surgery man that, that really took me to new levels but dude I appreciate it and I appreciate you and you're obviously an incredible doctor oh, and love dude. watching your videos and how educational they are and you touch lives in in big ways I appreciate that and I do appreciate what you said like that's what, at the end of the day, we're humankind, right? We may be Americans, Australians, whatever, but we are a human race. We are humankind, not mankind, human. Mm -hmm. And somehow we forget that. And the biggest thing is we all have the health challenges. We all have the challenges of cancer and all these things. Why wouldn't we just try to make it universal? Like, like you said, we're, do, we're trying to do that with Metadox and NFT. And in the same capacity, Xcures is actually the company that like, brought, like had me stumble upon what they're doing and then and this podcast is they're trying to do the same thing. They're like, stop having these focalities of like, this is the company that'll do this study and this one will do this one. Instead, they're like, let's just aggregate everything. We're, we're, we're humankind. What is, the, what is right. happening in patients that have these mutations and do they make your chance of breast cancer higher? Did they play a role in your breast cancer? If you could just aggregate all of the oncologist information and we have ai i mean we have freaking ai now that can do all this in like a gazillion speed that we can that's the quickest way we push things in cancer management and understanding it's just to come together yeah. and bring it and share things and then also share the access part so they they want to make people feel that are in smaller communities and stuff the reassurance that they're getting the right therapy they give you with ai technology based on your entire analysis these are all the things that are standard of care in first line First, second, third, fourth, yep. fifth, and these are all the trials. And so, whether it's MetaDocs, like an NFT, where we're trying to build a community, whether it's Xcures, we just need to all come together. And I do feel, if there's anything else that or anything positive came from COVID, I'm not saying it's positive, but if there was if there was a secondary thing, it was that we have a collective battle, we have a collective yep. initiative to beat that, and to really like expand our knowledge and understanding, collaborative, collaborative. Well, it expands exposed a lot of issues in the healthcare system, which, you know, the good thing is that a lot of docs are speaking up now. Maybe I wish more would. Um, I wish that some of us didn't feel like we couldn't speak up and, and speak our mind, but like it exposed a lot of issues. And I think that's what brought a lot of us together behind the scenes was like, dude, like, why are we putting up with this scenario? Like, we're so underappreciated in certain areas. And, you know, I, people laugh during COVID, like you're a plastic surgeon. I'm like, bro, you have no idea. Like I'm general surgery trained, critical care. Like I could step in the ICU still at this stage of my life and run a vent and I'd have to brush up on stuff. But like, we all train at the basics to do that stuff. And so, you know, if I had to step up and do that, I was going to do it. And just the stuff that they were doing and putting doctors through and putting them in danger is just, it was sad. But dude, we're here. We're on the other end of it. We came out of it. Yeah, we're all very Hopefully lucky. We'll move on everyone, upward. anyone that has the capacity to listen to this and us be on it, there's just there's no quantifiable number of things to be like really at the end of the day grateful for and lucky like that we have, you know, for anything. Totally. Which is crazy. Hundred percent. All right, sir. I cannot wait right, to see you soon. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on yeah, here. Yeah, appreciate and, you. Uh, where can people find you? Um, yeah, so you can find me at TikTok. It's at the real TikTok doc, and then uh, on Instagram, it's at dr richard j brown. On YouTube, I am Dr. Ricky. That one's growing fast. Man, we were at like 20K, I don't know, two months ago, and I'm at 550 now. Like, we had this crazy explosion out of nowhere on shorts. It's insane. insane. But I always try to make good, good content for you guys. So if you guys follow those platforms, and I think Twitter, Twitter's also at DR Richard J. Brown. But um, you guys, your fans, whoever's watching, can reach out to me anytime if they have questions, and I'll answer whatever I can. But that's where you can find oh, me. Nice.